Hi, physiology students at Rio Hondo. This, we are in chapter 13, which is all on the functions and components of the circulatory system. Um, it's a longer chapter. So if there's any sort of like anatomy involved, I might skip over those slides. You're still responsible for those, but I'll try to focus on the physiology components um, of this. So here we have the functions of your circulatory system. And again, your circulatory system um, consists of all of your blood vessels that transport oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout the body. So the main function is transportation of those respiratory gases, transportation of nutrients, wastes, regulations of hormones and temperature. Uh, your hormones will get transported throughout the body um, in the bloodstream and also temperature regulation. Uh, your um, blood vessels can constrict or dilate uh, to help with maintaining um, temperature. And also protection, different leukocytes, your white blood cells travel throughout your bloodstream as well as clotting factors, your platelets. So your cardiovascular system is one of the major components which um, is made up of your heart and your blood vessels which are listed there. Um, your circulatory system is also made up of the lymphatic system which includes all of your lymphatic vessels, tissues and organs. And your lymphatic system is kind of the catch-all for all extra, uh, all the other interstitial fluid and kind of cleansing that in the body. So composition of blood, um, the average adult volume contains about five liters of blood. Arterial blood leaves the heart, it's bright red, it's oxygenated except for blood going to your lungs and venous blood enters the heart. It's also it's more darkish red, um, so it's so kind of, I wouldn't call it blue, but it's darker red than the bright red that you would see in the arterial blood. And your venous blood is deoxygenated except for blood coming from the lungs. Uh, blood is made up of 45% formed elements, which are all of the cells and platelet component, components, and 55% plasma by volume. So here's a look at a centrifuge blood sample, which means this is a sample taken from somebody it's centrifuged or spun down extremely quickly and the blood plasma floats to the top after that spinning down. The buffy coat is in the middle which contains all of your platelets and white blood cells and then the red blood cells will sink to the bottom which are all of your erythrocytes. So again the formed elements are made up of your platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells and the blood plasma floats to the top. So your plasma is the fluid part of blood. It's made mostly of water and all dissolved solutes. And this is a look at normal blood values, um, looking at blood volume, blood, blood osmolarity, blood pH, and then the different of enzymes um, that are seen in the blood, as well as the hematology values, which uh, look at the hematocrit, hemoglobin, and the red and white blood cell count. So these are normal blood values. Here's, here are normal blood values of um, different hormones, ions, and organic molecules. I probably won't ask specific questions about these, um, but it's just good to know the different types of things you can measure uh, from taking um, plasma and blood samples. Uh, so plasma is made up of plasma proteins, which make up about seven to eight percent. Albumin is the protein which will create osmotic pressure to help draw water from tissues into capillaries to maintain blood volume and pressure. We have globulins and fibrinogen. Globulins will help transport lipids and fat soluble vitamins. And fibrinogen is a protein that helps in blood clotting after it becomes fibrin. Plasma volume, you have different regulatory mechanisms will, which will maintain plasma volume to maintain blood pressure. Um, so for example, antidiuretic hormone um, will be released from the hypothalamus from the posterior pituitary gland. Um, if fluid is lost in the body, antidiuretic hormone will tell your kidneys to retain more water. Erythrocytes are a part of the formed elements of the blood. These are red blood cells. They're flattened by concave discs. They, their only function is to carry oxygen and hemoglobin. They do not have nuclei, lots of mitochondria. Um, the lifespan is about 120 days throughout the body and each contain about 280 million hemoglobin molecules. Um, the iron heme in the center of each kind of quadrant of a hemoglobin protein is recycled from your liver and spleen. And anemia 
is what we call abnormally low hemoglobin or red blood cell count. And you can have different types of anemia. So here's a look at a red blood cell, no nucleus, the biconcave or donut like shaped. Um, the sole purpose of red blood cells is to carry oxygen and hemoglobin. Leukocytes are white blood cells. They do have a nucleus and mitochondria. Um, their count is shown there. There's different types of leuco leukocytes, whether they're granular or agranular. You might have learned a little bit of this from anatomy, so brush up on what the granular leuco leukocytes are and what the agranular leuco leukocytes are. And this just shows the blood cells and the platelets of the formed elements of blood. Here are the three types of granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. You can see they have teeny tiny specks of granules. And then the monocytes and lymphocytes um, are the other two types of leukocytes. And then we have platelets, which help to form blood clots, and the erythrocytes, the red blood cells. So here are platelets, also called thrombocytes. They're smallest, they lack nuclei as well, they're short-lived, and they will clot blood with several other chemicals and fibrinogen, the protein in plasma, and they will also release serotonin that stimulates vasoconstriction of your blood vessels, which makes sense. If you have some sort of injury, you want your blood vessels to constrict. So platelets will kind of have a twofold effect for that. This is a great chart to review the formed elements of the blood um, and kind of the description and their function. So you can pause this lecture at any time to kind of review that chart. Hematopoiesis is the process of blood cell formation um, coming from hematopoietic stem cells, which are embryonic cell cells that give rise to all blood cells. And then from there, the cells will differentiate um, to form different types of cells. Erythropoiesis is the formation of red blood cells. It occurs in the red bone marrow. Um, the regulation of erythropoiesis is due to a hormone called erythropoietin, which will be released from your kidneys when low um, oxygen levels are present. A little bit more about erythropoiesis. Uh, most iron will be recycled from old red blood cells and the rest of iron comes from the diet. Um, Iron is transferred through the blood bound to transferrin, and a major regulator of iron homeostasis is the hormone hepcidin. Um, so this is just a look at the stages of erythropoiesis, starting from a stem cell and then differentiating itself eventually into a red blood cell and erythrocyte, which is released into the blood. Leukopoiesis is the formation of white blood cells, and that's all I really want you guys to know about that. Um, thrombopoietin stimulates the growth of megakaryocytes and their future maturation into platelets. Thrombocytosis is an abnormally elevated platelet count, and this occurs when conditions such as acute blood loss, inflammation, cancer, and others will stimulate the liver to produce an excess of thrombopoietin. Then we'll talk about red blood cell antigens and blood typing. Uh, antigens are found on the surface of cells to help the immune system recognize itself. So the antigens present on your red, red blood cells will give the blood uh, type that you have. And an antibody is secreted by lymphocytes in response to a foreign cell. So we get to our ABO blood typing system where everyone has a specific blood type. So the antigen on an erythrocyte cell surface gives a person that blood type. So if you are type A, you have the A antigen. And if you are type B, you have the B antigen on your red blood cells. If you're type AB, you have both A and B antigens on your red blood cells. And if you're type O, you have neither the A nor the B antigen. So here's a look at the ABO system. The genotype, don't worry too much about that. That's the genotype that gets passed down. But here is the antigen present, and you will create antibodies in your plasma against antigens of anything foreign. So I am type A um, blood, so I have the A antigen on my red blood cells, and my plasma has created antibodies um, against B. So we call them anti-B antibodies. Uh, type O blood, because it has um, neither antigen on its red blood cells, it will have it will create antibodies for both anti-A and anti-B. And 
type AB blood has the AB antigen on its red blood cells. And because it has both antigens on its red blood cells, it, will, it won't create any antibodies because it doesn't want to create any antibodies against the A or B antigen because it has those both recognized as cell on its red blood cells. So this just describes how the plasma will contain antibodies against the antigens that aren't present. Um, so type O has both, has both type of antibodies. We call it the universal donor because of that. Type AB blood has no antibodies present and we call it the universal recipient. A transfusion reaction, if a person receives the wrong blood type, antibodies will bind to erythrocytes to try to attack those antigens that it recognizes as foreign and it causes agglutination or clumping of red blood cells. So this just shows uh, a type A red blood cell has these um, A antigens on it and it will form antibodies um, against the B antigen. And you can kind of see these anti-B antibodies will hook up. It has a square receptor site and that will hook up to the B antigens on the type B um, red blood cell. So here we have um, agglutination will occur if an anti-B antibody in a type A person will um, kind of meet up and hook up with a type B red blood cell and agglutination occurs. Similarly, the type B people have the anti-A antibodies, which will fit nicely or have a receptor for the um, type A antigen on a red blood cell. So this just is what happens. Agglutination will occur when these antibodies kind of bind to the foreign antigen and when it binds to a foreign antigen or red blood cell, it will cause clumping to occur. And that's what agglutination is. Agglutination can be useful um, to detect for blood typing. So if no, so this is showing um, kind of a mixing of blood. And this is just showing agglutination is occurring when you mix type A blood with an anti-A antibody, um, you see this clumping or agglutination occurring type B blood mixed with an anti-B antibody. Um, type AB blood shows clumping um, really mixed with either antibody um, because either antibody will bind up with those um, antigens on a type AB red blood cell. So it gets a little more confusing because you have a positive or negative to your blood type as I'm sure you're aware. And really simply put that positive or negative just means that you have an extra antibody either present or absent on the surface of your red blood cells. So if you're positive, you have the RH factor, which is the antigen D. And if you're negative, you do not have that antigen. If you're RH negative, so if you're A negative, for example, you will not have antibodies against that RH antigen unless you're exposed to RH positive blood. And you'll only be exposed to RH positive blood either through a blood transfusion or pregnancy. And we have an issue in pregnancy. For example, if a negative mother is exposed to a fetus with positive blood, that, that negative mother will begin to produce antibodies against that positive RH factor. This may cause what we um, call erythroblastosis fatalis in future pregnancies as antibodies could cross the placenta between um, the mother and fetus and attack fetal red blood cells. So um, in pregnancy, a negative mother will be treated with rogam, rogam that will inactivate its antigens for subsequent pregnancies. Hemostasis is a cessation of bleeding when a blood vessel is damaged. Damage exposes collagen fibers to the blood which produce vasoconstriction, forms a platelet plug and the formation of a fibrin protein web. So everything to try to form a blood clot and to stop um, bleeding. Platelets and blood vessel walls. Um, this kind of takes you through a little bit more about how platelets and blood vessels walls will interact. I don't know if I'll ask you too much about that slide. Um, you can kind of read through the platelets and blood vessel walls here and how exactly platelets will try to create a plug to stop the bleeding from occurring. I won't ask you too many um, exact uh, details about that though. Just you should know that activated platelets will also activate plasma clotting factors. So this just shows you 
um, how different factors will produce a blood clot. If we have any sort of damaged blood cell, fibrin will be present to try to produce what we call a platelet club, platelet plug. Uh, plotting, clotting factors are the formation of fibrin. Uh, fibrinogen is converted to fibrin via one of these two pathways. And fibrin is, will be what will form this kind of fibrin web of protein to try to trap red blood cells from leaving a damaged area, again, because you don't want to be bleeding internally or externally. So these fibrin proteins will form this kind of web to try to trap red blood cells. Here are plasma clotting factors, the pathway, the function of each. Um, just knowing some of their names is important, some of the clotting factors, but you know, don't need to know specific functions or pathways. This takes you more through clotting factors and the formation of fibrin. Um, an important thing to note is that vitamin K is needed by the liver to make several of the needed clotting factors. Here are clotting pathways. Um, you can skip over that slide. Clotting disorders, um, usually due to vitamin K deficiency, um, other recessive traits, which would delay formation of fibrin. Um, and anticoagulants, aspirin, Kumarin, heparin, and citrate are some of the kind of, they um, inhibit blood clots from forming. More about blood clotting, how we dissolution the clots. So after the clots have done their job of stopping blood, um, plasmin will digest the fibrin. So clotting can be prevented with certain drugs um, like heparin and coumadin, which many people who have high blood pressure um, or are, are at risk for stroke or heart disease will take heparin or coumadin uh, to try to uh, reduce clotting. The structure of the heart then we'll get into has four chambers. You should be really familiar with the chambers of the heart, what each chamber does. And if you don't remember that, please review it. Um, you should have known it from anatomy. There's a fibrous skeleton to it as well, um, which you can read through. There's what we called pulmonary and systemic circulation. Pulmonary circulation is between the heart and the lungs and systemic circulation is between the heart and the body tissues. So here's a great chart to review pulmonary and systemic circulation. I'm hoping this is a review from anatomy but you should know very well these two types of circulations where blood flows and which blood vessels will carry deoxygenated blood and which blood vessels will carry oxygenated blood. And this is a great review of which blood vessels, pulmonary arteries or pulmonary veins, and whether their oxygen contents are high or low. Uh, you have different valves. Your AV valves are located between atria and ventricles, and your semilunar valves are located between ventricles and arteries leaving the heart. Again, study these slides if you need a refresher from anatomy. This is a look at where the valves are located. And this is a great picture um, of the anatomy of the heart. Because the heart is so important to all functions of the body, um, I'll probably ask you some anatomy questions of the heart. So be sure to um, remember those heart details. The heart sounds are produced by the closing of the valves. The lub is the closing of the AV valve. This will occur at ventricular systole. And the dub sound is the closing of the semilunar valves, which occurs at ventricle, ventricular diastole. And this is where a stethoscope will listen for these heart sounds um, in different parts of the body. So this is when your doctor is listening. He'll often listen for kind of at the base of the heart, the apex region, because that will give the sound of the bicuspid or mitral um, valve closing. A heart murmur is just an abnormal heart sound produced by abnormal blood flow through the heart. And many, is, many are caused by a defected heart valve. Mitral stenosis is what we call when the mitral valve will calcify and impair flow between the left atrium and the ventricle. And this could be a result from pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure uh, doing in the um, pulmonary blood vessels. An incompetent valve does not close properly. Um, it could be due to damaged papillary muscles and mitral valve prolapse is the most common cause of a chronic mitral regurgitation where blood will flow back up into an atria when it's only supposed to be going in one direction. A septal defect is a hole in the interventricular 
um, wall or interatrial wall, which will allow blood to cross sides. The patent ductus arteriosus will result from a failure of the foramen ovale uh, to close after birth. So here's a look at abnormal blood flow um, and different due to septal defects, um, due to a valve not closing all the way. So this is a septal defect in the atria where you can see there's between the wall, there's a hole. And here's a septal defect in the ventricles. There's a hole between the walls of the ventricles. The cardiac cycle is important. It involves the repeating pattern of contraction and relaxation of the heart. Systole is contraction of heart muscles and diastole is relaxation of heart muscles. The end diastolic volume is the total volume of the blood in the ventricles, ventricles at the end of diastole and end systolic, systolic volume is the total amount of blood left in the left ventricle after systole. So here's a look at like in general, um, the amount of time the heart spends in systole and diastole. Again, systole is when the ventricles contract and the atria are relaxed. And diastole is when the ventricles relax and fill. Um, and this is kind of the whole cardiac cycle, which will continue to repeat. Uh, pressure changes during the cardiac cycle. Um, I'm going to let you guys read through these um, pressure changes on your own because if I were in lecture, I would just be reading them for you. So please read through these pressure changes during the cardiac cycle. And then this is the cardiac cycle showing those pressure changes in these graphs on the left, also showing the volume um, of the ventricles. And you can see here, this includes the first and second heart sounds. This is just a great look showing how pressure, volume, and time are all um, compared as we take through the five, um, or the, yeah, the five phases of the cardiac cycle. So in the first phase, we call this isovolumetric contraction. The second phase is ejection of the blood from the ventricles. The third phase is isovolumetric relaxation. And then fourth is rapid filling and fifth is atrial contraction, which will eject the blood from the atria back into the ventricles. So be really familiar with these five phases of the cardiac cycle um, and take your time kind of looking through and seeing, you can kind of zoom in on these pictures in the um, PowerPoint um, to see exactly what's happening in each phase. The electrical activity of the heart and the ECG or the electrocardiogram is really important to determine if there's any defect in the heart. So as you know, cardiac muscle cells are interconnected by intercalated discs. And once stimulation is applied, the impulse flows from cell to cell. And the area of the heart that contracts from one stimulation event is called the myocardial, myocardium. And the atrium ventricles will be separated electrically by the fibrous skeleton. So the automaticity is the automatic nature of the heartbeat. So this means that your heart can initiate its own heartbeat. It starts in uh, the SA node, which is the heart's pacemaker located in the right atrium. The AV node and Purkinje fibers are secondary pacemakers. They are slower than the sinus rhythm. So the pacemaker potential, basically the pacemaker starts the heartbeat itself. And this takes you through what ion channels are opening. Um, but this takes you through kind of the pacemaker and action potentials um, showing you what's happening. I won't ask you too much about that, but I do want you to know in general, um, I'm gonna skip over a little bit of this. Um, this takes you through the action potential in a myocardial cell. I want you to know how the conduction of these action potentials occur throughout the heart. Um, so action potentials spread through those intercalated discs and they spread beginning in the SA node to the AV node to stimulate atrial contraction. The AV node is at the base of the right atrium and the bundle of his will conduct the, that stimulation further onto the ventricles. In the interventricular septum, the bundle of his divides into right and left Purkinje fibers. And it's those Purkinje fibers which travel into the myocardium walls of the ventricles, which will stimulate ventricular contraction. So just pause the slide and read through these steps, the conducting tissues of the heart, because this is what I want you to know, how electrical activity gets passed through the heart. 
And this picture describes it um, in a visual way. So electrical activity starts in the SA node, gets passed to the AV node down the bundle of his into the right and left bundle branches and then into the Purkinje fibers. And this depolarization of electrical activity is what will cause the heart to contract as a unit and cause contraction of atria and then ventricles. The conduction of impulses, uh, the action potentials from the SA node spread rapidly, but at the AV node, things will slow down um, and the speed will pick up again in the bundle of his reaching the Purkinje fibers. So your ventricles will contract about 0.1 to 0.2 seconds after the atria contract. And that's due to kind of the slowing down at the AV node. Excitation contraction coupling also occurs here due to calcium release binding to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. I won't ask you guys too much, know too much about this in the heart, um, but this just is a great graph showing where the action potential occurs. And then milliseconds later, the contraction will occur, which will be generated by the tension. Uh, repolarization occurs and then the myocardium will relax as things go back to normal. There's a refractory period because the atria and ventricles contract as single units. They cannot sustain a contraction. Um, so because the action potential of cardiac cells is long, they also have a longer refractory period before they can contract again. And that's just the relaxation time. So an ECG is important because it records the electrical activity of the heart by picking up the movement of ions in body tissues. Um, it does not record action potentials, but it results from waves of depolarization, um, the electrical events leading to contraction and relaxation. So you should be familiar with the ECG waves and intervals. The P wave is when the atria depolarize. The PQ interval is atrial systole. The QRS wave is ventricular depolarization. And then the ST segment is what we call the plateau phase or ventricular systole. And then the T wave is ventricular repolarization. So you should be really familiar with um, graphing or being able to um, label an ECG and then knowing what happens at segment of the graph. And again, those are shown in this slide. So this shows the relationship between the impulse conduction and the ECG. So this just shows you, um, again, the P wave is the atria depolarize and contract. The QRS complex is the ventricular, ventricles depolarize, contract, and then the T wave is the ventriculars repolarize and relax. So this is a normal ECG showing normal sinus electrical rhythm. If anything is off in an ECG, and this is measured in a clinical hospital setting, they even hook up ECGs to measure baby heart rates when you're um, in labor and delivery. Um, if anything is off in the graph, it could um, initiate or signify that something is wrong in how the atria and ventricles are contracting because the electrical activity isn't getting through um, in the correct amount of time. Um, so these, this is just showing where the limb leads are placed. Usually there's three limbs placed on the right arm, um, the left leg, and then the left arm and left leg. And this just is showing how the different leads are placed of um, an ECG to pick up ECG waves because your skin will show electrical activity um, that's coming from your heart. So it's able to record the electrical activity of the heart taken from these different leads. And you don't need to know specifics about the leads. Uh, the ECG and heart sounds, the lub sounds will occur after the QRS wave as the AV valves close. And the dub sound, that's the second heart sound. So the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, you hear in a stethoscope. Um, again, the dub sound is the second heart sound occurs at the beginning of the T wave as the SL valves close. And again, this is a great graph showing the heart sounds where they will occur in the ECG segment and showing the pressure in the ventricles as pressure builds and then decreases um, as um, blood is ejected from the ventricles. Arrhythmias are any sort of abnormal pattern of electrical activity that results in abnormalities of the heartbeat. Drugs are used to treat arrhythmias that affect the nature and conduction of the cardiac action potentials. And we put the drugs into four different groups 
You don't need to know the specific group and type of drugs, but different drugs will block sodium channels, potassium channels, calcium channels, or will be other beta blockers. Then into blood vessels. These are the different types of blood vessels. And again, review this from anatomy, spend some time brushing up on this, um, knowing the different sizes of blood vessels, whether it's a large vein, large artery, medium-sized vein, medium-sized artery, venule, arterial, and then capillaries. You'll notice here that large arteries and medium-sized arteries always have a thicker layer of the tunica media, which is the smooth muscle. And the medium-sized veins have valves in them, um, which help to keep blood flowing back up to the heart in your legs. So here are the tunics or the layers of the blood vessels. I'm gonna have you guys review these on your own. Um, so these are just the layers that make up all of the blood vessels. This describes the different sizes of arteries. Elastic arteries are closer to the heart. Muscular arteries are farther away from the heart and they have more smooth muscle. And then arterial oles will be the arteries that provide the greatest resistance and control of blood flow through the capillaries happens at the arterioles. An aneurysm is any sort of balloon-like swelling in an artery or in a weakened ventricular wall. It most commonly occurs in the aorta or the descending aorta, and the aneurysm could eventually burst, which is not good. Um, and an aneurysm usually results from a congenital causes and arthrosclerosis, which is a buildup of plaque, um, but hypertension and diabetes can also increase the risk of an aneurysm. And again, an aneurysm would be bad if it would be to burst because then the whole blood vessel um, is broken and leaking blood out and you'd be internally bleeding. Microcirculation um, describes how different sphincters um, called precapillary sphincters found in your arterioles will constrict or dilate to control uh, blood flow through the capillaries and then back through your venules and veins. So that's what microcirculation is. The capillaries are the smallest blood vessel. This is where gases and nutrients will be exchanged between blood and tissues. And again, it's regulated by vasoconstriction and vasodilation of arterioles through those pre-capillary sphincters. These are the three different types of capillaries that I'll let you guys read through. You should know the three different types of capillaries. So feel free to read through those. And this is just a look at different types of capillaries um, whether it's a muscle capillary or a visceral, visceral capillary. Veins, um, an interesting thing about veins is they're called the reservoirs of blood. So most of your total blood volume is just hanging out in your veins. So they'll have a lower pressure than arterial pressure. They'll have thinner walls, um, a larger lumen, and they collapse when cut because they won't have as much smooth muscle around them. Uh, veins need help to return blood to the heart, so they use skeletal muscle pumps, which muscles surrounding the veins will help pump the blood, as well as valves, which will ensure one directional flow through the blood. So this is a look at a skeletal muscle pump. When a contracted skeletal muscle contracts, that'll push blood flow up, also showing how valves will close once blood gives, gets up a certain point. Due to that gravity, blood would want to flow back down, but the closing of the valve will will keep the blood at that level, again, to try to get the blood back to the heart as quickly as possible. Varicose veins are enlarged surface veins, usually happens in the lower limb, um, when occurs when venous congestion stretches the veins to a point that the venous valves no longer close effectively. It could occur from genetics, also long periods of standing, obesity, age, um, also due to pregnancy, due to some compression of abdominal veins by the fetus, Walking can reduce venous congestion in varicose range veins, as well as compression stockings and leg elevation. Some people get their varicose veins surgically treated, um, which includes sclerotherapy using la laser therapy, ligation, and stripping of the veins. Uh, deep vein thrombosis has to do with inadequate venous blood flow in patients who are usually bedridden um, so they could lead to a deep vein thrombosis, um, which is just basically a, a clot in the veins, but it could turn into a thromboembolism, which could then travel places. So walking around as soon as possible after surgery 
is really ideal to reduce the risk as using compression stockings and other devices that compress the leg. Anticoagulant drugs or thrombolytic agents may also be necessary to prevent or treat a thromboembolism so it doesn't result in a potentially fatal pulmonary embolism, which is a clot that would travel to the lungs and block um, blood supply within the lungs. So it would block the ability um, for oxygenated blood to get to the heart and then to the rest of the body. Arthrosclerosis and cardiac arrhythmia. So arthrosclerosis is the common form. Um, this is just hardening of the arteries. It contributes to 50% of deaths due to heart attack and stroke. It's when plaques will protrude into the lumen of your arteries and reduce blood flow. Uh, causes of this are smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. So this is just a look how a thrombus or a plaque will form in an artery. And you can see how it will um, really kind of constrict blood throw, flow through the artery. Not good. This is how arthrosclerosis develops um, through the fatty streaks, smooth muscle, a cap of connective tissue covers it. Um, so you can read through that. Cholesterol and lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins carry cholesterol to arteries. So people who consume or produce a lot of cholesterol have more LDLs. And this high LDL level will be associated with increased development of that arthrosclerosis. This is a lipoprotein um, and cholesterol and lipoproteins, high density lipoproteins, L HDLs carry cholesterol away from the arteries to the liver for metabolism. Um, so statin drugs like Lipitor will increase HDL levels because they're taking away um, the, the cholesterol away from the arteries. So that is actually a good thing. So HDLs are good lipoproteins. Inflammation and arthrosclerosis, it's now believed to be an inflammatory disease, um, which you can read through on your own. So a measure of inflammation. Ischemic heart disease, it's a condition characterized by inadequate oxygen due to re reduced blood flow. Arthrosclerosis will often be the main cause. It's associated with increased production of lactic acid and pain. Um, and eventually necrosis of some areas of the heart will occur, leading to an MI heart attack myocardial infarction. Um, nitroglycerin produces vasodilation to help produce improve blood flow. So dead myocardial cells can never be replaced. Reperfusion injury may also cause death of neighboring cells to enlarge the infarct or the damage of that heart attack. Detecting ischemia is usually due to depression of the ST segment. Um, so see here, this is ischemia can be found on an ECG. So this is why electrocardiograms, they look for any sort of deviation from normal and a deviation in ST depression would be a um, result of an ischemia. Um, and again, an ischemia, ischemia is any condition characterized by inadequate oxygen due to reduced blood flow. Other abnormal heart rhythm, a bradycardia is a slow heart rate below 60 beats per minute. Tachycardia is a fast heart rate above 100 beats per minute. Um, these heart rhythm, Rhythms are normal if the person is active, um, but not normal at rest. Abnormal tachycardia can occur due to drugs or fast ectopic pacemakers. The ventricular tachycardia will occur when pacemakers in the ventricles make them contract out of sync. And this condition is extremely dangerous and can lead to ventricular fibrillation and sudden death. Flutter and fibrillation. Flutter is extremely fast heart beats but coordinated contractions and a fibrillation is an uncoordinated pumping between the atria and ventricles. So here's a look at what a sinus bradycardia slow heart rate would look like on an ECG. Tachycardia is faster than ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So again, extremely important um, use of the ECG and ways of using it to detect any abnormalities in the heart. More types of fibrillation, atrial fibrillation can result from atrial flutter where the atrial muscles cannot effectively contract. So the AV node can't keep pace with the speed of the atrial contractions. Some stimulation will be passed on 
um, it could reduce cardiac output only by 15% because some of that electrical activity is still getting to the ventricles. And this is associated with increased risk of a thrombi, which is a clot, stroke, or heart failure. Ventricular fibrillation is when the ventricles cannot pump blood and the victim dies without CPR or any sort of electrical defibrillation. Um, it's caused by circus rhythms or continuous cycling, cycl cycling of electrical waves. Um, sudden death will progress from ventricular tachycardia through ventricular fibrillation ending in astole, which is a straight line ECG. An AV node block is when there's damage to the AV node. This can be seen in changes to the PR interval, and we call a first degree, second degree, or third degree AV block. Um, a first degree block is when the impulse conduction exceeds the normal time it takes, so it just slows it down. So the electrical activity will still reach the ventricles, but just at a slower pace. A second degree block is when not every electrical wave can pass to the ventricles. And a third degree or complete block is when no stimulation gets through and a pacemaker in the Purkinje fibers um, will take over, but it will be extremely slow. And this just shows differences between a first degree block, a second degree block, and a third degree AV block. And what you'll notice eventually, eventually is that eventually um, you'll see P waves, but no QRS complexes, because that's because the electrical activity doesn't get down to the ventricles. The lymphatic system then is kind of, we include it in here. Um, it basically transports excess interstitial fluid as lymph from the tissues to the veins. It produces and houses lymphocytes for the immune response. And then it transports absorbed fats from the intestines to the blood. I want you guys to know the lymphatic system. Um, you should know it's kind of its own separate system. It's the catch-all system. It will eventually move what it has into it back to um, the superior vena cava to get back into the blood. Other than that, um, the lymphatic capillaries, lymphatic ducts are part of the vessels of the lymphatic system, but I won't have you guys know too many details of that. Just know that your lymphatic system is the catch-all system of any other excess interstitial fluid. And then it will eventually form and deliver its fluid um, into subclavian veins and into the blood. Here are organs of the lymphatic system, your tonsils, thymus, spleen, they're the sites for lymphocyte production. And you can see here how they're located throughout the body. If you have some sort of um, um, lymph lymphedemia is a swelling of an arm or leg caused by excessive amounts of fluid and protein in the interstitial fluid. This could be a result of some sort of blockage or destruction of a lymphatic drainage. And that's the end of this chapter. Thanks for listening, guys.